all these worldwide contexts and paradigms and try to interpret it. And my speech today is the first iteration of my evolving thinking. So I'm sharing it with you. I need my clicker. Uh, who is here? Okay. So, so when I started this presentation two months or three months ago, I, I titled it, I titled it, I titled, I titled it uh, Interpreting Contexts, Working in Multiple con uh, Paradigms. And it was a more theoretical uh, uh, presentation. It has to look at how you interpret changing contexts. But I changed it to navigating paradigms because I thought I should get a more action-oriented theme to convey to you. And I love the word, and I love the word paradigm. Yeah? I heard the word paradigm from the book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, which was published in the 60s and 70s by Thomas Kuhn. But the word was first used by the German philosopher Immanuel Kant, a great philosopher. And I learned it in the context as a CEO in Prudential in the early 1990s. Yeah? Because the people who taught me customer service told me, if you really want to be innovative, if you really want to transform your customer service center or your product marketing team, you cannot ask people who are inside them because they have a vested interest in your current structure and their worldview is shaped by the paradigm they have. You want to change the paradigm, you've got to go at the margins of the paradigm or outside the paradigm to change it. So today, I'm going to ask you to relax your own paradigms of how you work, how you live, and the things you do, and examine competing paradigms and see where you are. So that was a why I chose paradigm. So the first thing I want to do is to look at two extreme worldviews, two extreme worldviews, right? And then everything in between. The first worldview, the first worldview is that you are going through a period of dramatic change and revolution in the way we live, we work, and the way industry is structured. And it is unprecedented, unprecedented in history. Unprecedented in history. Led mainly by the digital revolution. Yeah? And it will change everything fundamentally in the next 30 years. And it started in the year 2007. Ask me about that. It's about speed, it's about pervasiveness, and it's about impact. The second paradigm is that the world is always changing. It's not a big deal. And we've been through this before. Agricultural revolution came and here, industrial revolution came and here, cars came and here, uh, fax machine came and gone. So it's not a big deal. Have no fear. Everything will be fine. And there are many of these people in the insurance industry, right? Especially our insurance industry is, is a complicated industry. It's protected. And after all, our industry is a people business, you know? And our products got to be sold, not bought. So therefore, don't worry, you'll come, but come gradually. I didn't say it's the wrong word view. I didn't say it's the wrong word view. It could be the right word view. And I didn't say that A word view is the wrong word view or the right word view. I want to ask you to think about the logic of the word views because it's going to be dependent on the context you are in. Because I have an insurance CEO today running a big business at Prudential. Yeah, it actually, my revenues are from the agency business. Yeah? And it will be true in the next three years. So therefore, paradigm B works for me. In fact, all this digital stuff are disruption, uh, are distractions. Right? It's a reasonable worldview. But I've got, I've got people who are on the first left hand side whose worldview are completely different. So where do you stand as a young actuary, right? As a young actuary. So therefore, I'm going to sit on your side. Yeah? and look at all these competing worldviews and try to make sense and logic about it. So that whatever you chose to do 10, 20 years ago and you have landed, still makes sense for the next 20 or 30 years. You got it? Okay? It's a setup. Am I speaking too quickly? Am I speaking too quickly? No, I'm okay with it. I'm to speak because I'm speaking quite quickly because I want to compress uh, what I have to convey to you in the time I have. So the structure of the presentation I'm going to explain to you basically 10 or 12 worldviews uh, in 10 minutes. 10 minutes order. And then I'm going to talk about the actuarial conundrum in 10 to 15 minutes. And then I'm going to introduce to you the idea of the Mero Vrack paradox and how you could navigate across paradigms. So the first thing, you have seen this book, is a, a very good book uh, about how professions will be impacted. Professions will be impacted by the digital revolution and his central thesis by the father and son team of Richard and Daniel Saskin is that we have increasingly capable machine, increasingly pervasive machine, increasingly connected humans and we are living in an internet-based society and professions 
like accountancy, medicine, uh, journalism, architecture, and natural science are anchored are anchored in a print-based society. The, the four st stages of society of organization of uh, communication is oral, when the early men started, script, which you write, then print-based, you came in three, four hundred years, and then now we are digital. And in the print, and our profession, actual science, is about 150 to 200 years old. And most professions, about 300 to 400 years old. He said that professions will become less relevant and will disappear over time. That is his fundamental thesis. And then he recommend, he recommend what are the things you need to go into in order to become uh, a person who can navigate into the future. And we'll talk more about that. Then the next two books are by Eric Brian Johnson and Andrew McAfee from MIT. Great books, great books, right? And basically, it's talk about exponential growth, digitization, and recombinant innovation. That means innovation across multiple domains. What do you mean by exponential? Exponential is the two to the power n, n is one, two, three, four, five, six. And at most law basically says that it doubles every year, right? Well, and it started 40 years ago in 1960, and now we are in the second half of the chessboard. We're in the second half of the chessboard, not the first half. And every year the change is massive. Yeah, you've got to use a logarithmic scale to understand it. And therefore the impact is massive, and we are reaching an inflection point. So they argue. And recombination, because it's not just about a single technology, it's about combining technologies and combining domains. Can you Google Photos? Google Photos is not just about photos. Photos, Google Photos is great because it's got facial recognition. Then they have GPS, which knows where you are located. Therefore, they've got algorithms. We can say it's a Hari Raya, it's a yoga, or it's a family, and then tell you who to share with because they have your behavioral data as well. And that's why Google Photos is a combination of multiple technologies. I think the list goes endless. Then he went on to a second book, which is about machine, platform, and crowds. Because it's not just about the power of machine, it's about platform and crowds. And platform and crowds are something you need to understand because the most massive companies in the world today, the fans, Facebook, Alibaba, Tencent, Google, and so on, they are all network companies. They're not, they are platform and platform companies. They're not propriety, product, and services companies. The next three books, the first two books are daily link books about the rise of robots. The rise of robots, and the first book tells, documented the amazing uh, achievement of, of robots, and also the rise of machines and cybernetics. But the third book talks about the rise of artificial intelligence, right? Artificial general intelligence, which will be, which will be surpassing the intelligence of human beings in three or four decades time. You can believe it, you can argue about it, but that's the central thesis of Max Thurman, who is the director of the Life Institute in MIT. The next three books is something which all of you have to read. All of you have to read because it is about by Linda Grayton, Andrew Scott, Siddhartha Mukherjee, and Yuga Noah Hariri. Because it's about longevity, it's about dramatic leaps in longevity, genetics, and genomics. I was in the ICA, International Conference of Actuaries in Berlin, two months ago. And in that particular presentation from the professor of LSC in demography, an incredibly compelling presenter, he told the whole audience that you're blown away. You're blown away. He says that 28% of people born in Europe this year, 28% of people born in Europe will survive to age 100. I've not seen longevity improvements that is this presented that way. 10 days ago, on the National Day in Singapore, 9th of August, in the Financial Times Big Week, there was an article on the 100 year life, uh, and it was about a book written by my ex-professor Linda Grayton from LBS, London Business School. And, and he's an advisor to the Japanese government. 50%, 50% or more of Japanese born this year will survive to age 100. Think about that. 50% of the Japanese born in Japan this year will live to age 100 because of existing current improvements in mortality improvement. What does it mean in terms of retirement planning? What does it mean for a person when should he stop, stop work uh, because the funding is not going to be enough? 
then what does it mean in terms of training and education? We, we, we live in the world of a three-stage life, right? We went to study uh, at age 6 and graduate at 21 or 23, whether you do NS or not. After that, we work until age 16, 65, argue the government, maybe you should retire, then you retire. Yeah? But in that 100-year life, you will have multiple identities, multiple phases, right? And it is amazing how you know, organize this in terms of education and training. Imagine someone who is born in 1918, 1918, at the end of Second First World War, still alive today. What he learned in the 1920s and 30s, what can he apply today? Yeah, think about that in terms of implications. So you and our children are going to have an incredible time exploring these great issues. Right? And we have this amazing paradox, right? Amazing paradox. We have to work to a later age, right? Because our retirement funding is not enough to work longer, because the whole thing go longer, right? Makes sense, right? But then so government is going to give us more skills, upgrading, so we can work longer. At the same time, government is doing the smart nation, right? and so that more machine can take away your work. That's the paradox, right? That's the paradox, right? You've got to live and work longer to fund our retirement, but at the same time, we are making everything smart, so there's less work to do. Very brilliant, right? So this is what I call a paradox, right? So you'll see many paradox. So the ability to think in paradoxical terms Advantaging ambiguity, which is a function of adaptability, is one of the key mindsets which we need to acquire as a profession. And the last book, last set of books, are more historical narratives. Thomas Friedman, you may be familiar with him. He talks not just about the digital revolution, but climate change and globalization. The next book was a comparison about the amazing thing taking on today with the renaissance of the 1500 and 1600 age of discovery. The last book by historian Ferguson is really about, is really about uh, the rise of networks in place of hierarchies in organization and in society because of the power of networks. It looks at Twitter, Facebook and so forth. But the details are there. So there you are. So there you are. The world is changing according to different paradigms. So it's digital, it is about machine, it's about platform, it's about crowds, it's about globalization, it's about mother nature, sustainability, it's about a hundred year life and it's about networks, and many, many more, depending on who you talk about. And I know that all of you, and I spoke to some of the organizing committee, they are very busy, you're all too busy, and you have a four-letter word which interferes with what you are doing. And that four-letter word is called, not start with F, it's start with W, work. Yeah? Work is interfering with understanding all this.